Okay, looks like we're good to go. So I'm going to ask the Lord's blessing on our time this morning. I'm so grateful you're all here. And uh, we'll just ask the Lord's blessing. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we just praise you for this day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And Lord, we, we, we come before you asking you to open our spiritual eyes and ears that we might see Jesus, that we would know him better, fall in love with him, Lord, and then you would give us such a desire to go and tell others what we see. Lord, this is such a difficult, painful topic, but we so want your wisdom and your perspective on what to do when we're deeply hurt. Lord, would you transform us that we would have your mind on this, we would have your heart, um, and that we would walk in a way that is pleasing to you. I'd ask that you bless every woman here, women that may be watching later at home, and again, that we would just all leave rejoicing because you're a God who transforms us. And um, again, we praise you and thank you for your word and your Holy Spirit, and you'd, I'd ask that you'd be at work in each and every one of us, and we ask this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, ladies, um, if you'll open to Matthew 18, we're going to start there. Um, when I was praying about today, though, um, and I was praying, Lord, give us your perspective on forgiveness and and then I just had the thought and I'm sure it was from the Holy Spirit because it, 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 I didn't want to think in this way but it was like Kathy is that what I want and I said oh well, Lord I just assumed that you want what I want and uh, that's often most times wrong and so I felt like he was saying more than that we we each of us learn how to forgive those that have deeply hurt us that God wants to transform our thinking so that it in this whole area we have the mind of Christ and I think the reason that we we get wounded and we stay wounded and we get bitter is because we do not have God's mind and his heart on forgiveness do you ever remember a time when God really changed your thinking about something where you had an aha moment in the scriptures and you went oh my goodness I was totally looking at that wrong do you ever remember a time um I can remember one I had when I was a fairly new believer I was not raised in a Christian home and I came to the Lord um uh, in my older teenage years but I remember the shock it was to my system I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I was reading the Bible and I realized for the first time, the world does not revolve around me. I thought it did. I thought it was supposed to. And when I realized, oh my goodness, the world will not be right side up until I put God at the center. God is in control, not me. And I remember it was a shock to my system. Um, and so I was trying to think of a, an analogy to explain this. And I'm, I've shared with uh, many of you that the Lord just did a gracious thing and allowed me to become friends with Elizabeth Elliott. Does everybody know who Elizabeth Elliott is? We're going to talk about her. Oh, only three hands went up. Oh, okay. Are, is there, well, let me do this one. Who does not know who Elizabeth Elliott is? Oh, good. Then I get to introduce her to you. Um, when I became a Christian, um, I went off to a Bible college in Portland, Oregon called Multnomah. And Jim Elliott, Elizabeth Elliott's husband, Jim Elliott was from the Portland area. And so everybody at that Bible college knew about Jim Elliott. And so everybody kept talking about his wife, Elizabeth Elliott, and I didn't know who it was. So they introduced me to some of her books. The, the first book I read was called The Shadow of the Almighty. And the, the second one was Through Gates of Splendor. Both of those books are about what happened to her personally. She, she and her husband, Jim Elliott, went to the jungles of Ecuador as missionaries, newlyweds, missionaries. And they were working with one group of people when they learned about a remote people that lived way in the jungle, but that, that moved, migrated. So nobody ever really knew where they lived. At that time, they were called the Alka Indians. They were reportedly the most 
vicious uh, tribe, primitive tribe on the planet. They thought they might be cannibals. Nobody had ever gone into that tribe. Well, Jim Elliott and four other missionaries felt called of God to try to locate them and go in and share the gospel. When they, they prayed about it, they, they devised, one of them, Nate Saint, was a fantastic pilot, and he devised a way that he could hover his plane over the jungle and lure a rope with a bucket with gifts in it without the bucket flying and conking somebody out. They said it was amazing feat that he was able to do that. So they dropped gifts. Nobody knew the language, but a few years earlier, one girl had escaped the tribe and they had learned a few phrases of greeting, you know, hello, we're your friends. And then they were dropping gifts. When they felt it was time to go in, they went in and all five of them were killed, were, were martyred. And then after that, Elizabeth Elliott went in with her toddler daughter and then the wife of the pilot, Nate Saints, excuse me, sister, uh, Marge Saint, the two of them and this little girl went into the village, lived there and won them to Christ. Fantastic story of forgiveness and redemption. And so when I learned about her, I read every book I could get. She's written tons of books, but you really do need to read if you've never read it. They said her, that book she wrote about those men getting martyred and then them going in did more to um, get people on the mission field than any other single book that's ever been written. It's a fantastic story. So anyway, the Lord allowed me to become friends with her. And um, for those of you that don't know, my name is Kathy Jeffrey. I, I grew up right across the road. Um, when I lived out here, Robeson Ranch Road was a single dirt road. 35 was not even in yet. And my dad was a cattle rancher and I lived on that side of the road and our only neighbor was five miles away. The McSweens lived here where Ropes and Ranch is. And this was out in the boonies. Um, but Elizabeth, we became friends and I lived on in the old farmhouse that I grew up on. My husband and I moved out there and raised our children there. And we had a little guest cottage and Elizabeth Elliott was the first person to stay in the guest. I wanted to notch the bed. <laughs> anyway. It was just such a tremendous, so whenever she came to the Dallas-Fort Worth area to speak, she would stay in her home. And I've shared with some of my ladies, she was not from Texas. She was not Mormon fuzzy. She was a prim and proper Bostonian. And she'd tell you just what she thought. And I've, I've uh, I shared with my ladies and we all got a laugh because again, I'm a pray for me because I am not a teacher. And I'm really not a speaker. I'm a talker, but I, <laughs> but anyway, she said to me one morning over breakfast, she said, you know, Kathy, not everything needs to be said and not everything needs to be said by you. <laughs> so anyway, she, she really put me in my place, but I was thinking about the, uh, something she told me came to my mind when I'm thinking about, I, I want God to do a paradigm shift in our thinking about forgiveness. Um, and she told me this story, it has nothing to do with forgiveness, but it was one of those times where what she said, my, I could tell my, my perspective shifted. And she was telling about when she had a radio program and people would call in and ask questions. And this woman called in one morning and she was complaining about her husband snoring. And that was right at the top of her list of irritants. It had gone on. She tried to get her husband, all those you know, devices you can get, they didn't work. Um, I think this was before they had those sleep apnea machines, um, but uh, she was losing sleep and she was irritated about it and she was complaining and complaining. And then I said, well, what, what did you say to her, Elizabeth? And I said, snoring? is the most beautiful sound in the world. Ask any widow. Okay, did you just feel your thinking change? Okay, I went, oh my goodness. She wanted that woman to have a different perspective and look at how simply she did it. And I felt that that is what God wants for us. I think God will be thrilled if each of us can go out and forgive whoever has deeply hurt us, if we're still holding on to bitterness, but even more than that, that there would be a complete paradigm shift in our thinking about how we look at suffering, how we look at getting wounded, 
um, what what to do with bitterness. I hope everything changed. There, there's a verse in the book of the, the Old Testament in Hosea where God tells the people of Israel and he's speaking to them through the prophet because one more time they're fallen away from God. And he said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And I, I remember Elizabeth telling me that she thought for how to forgive was the missing sermon in the church. And we've got so many bitter Christians who we are perishing for lack of knowledge. And wisdom, wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective. And we want wisdom. Proverbs says wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. But with all your wisdom, get understanding or knowledge. And knowledge is when you live out that wisdom. And so God's saying, my people perish for lack of knowledge. We, we may know the word of God, but the book of James says, it's not the hearer of the word that's blessed. It's the doer of the word. So I want to, that's what I'm praying for, for this class is that there will be that paradigm shift and we will think like God thinks and we will do as God asks us to do. Uh, is everybody with me? Can somebody say amen? Okay, ladies, let's jump in there. We're going to start with Matthew 18. Um, and I'm going to preface that with one other little thing that I think was is another instance of a paradigm shift. Excuse me. You don't have to turn to it, but in Luke 12, you might want to look at it later. I remember this was one of those passages I was reading and it was a shock to my system because I thought, oh my goodness, look at Jesus. What is he doing? But in, in chapter 12, starting at verse 13, a man comes to Jesus and he says, and now Jesus has been talking to a group of people. And it says, one of that company comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, my brother is stealing my inheritance. Go and talk to my brother. And Jesus, instead, I'm thinking, oh, is Jesus going to go and straighten out that brother? And it was shocking because instead, Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, look at the covetousness in this man. Now, I, I thought, if for all we know, it was a legitimate grievance. This guy was being cheated out of his inheritance by his brother. Notice that didn't bother Jesus very much at all. Instead, what did he do? Look at the problem this man has. And ladies, that was a shift for me because I thought, how many people in prayer have I drugged to Jesus saying, this man was saying, Lord, go sick my brother. He is failing. My brother is sinning against me. Go get my brother. And G Jesus says, forget the brother. I want to have a encounter with you. I want you to be transformed. And you've got a problem. And ladies, I used to think we're going to go through this wounded spirit chart. Years and years of my Christian life, I ran around thinking that my greatest problem was my father. I hated my father. And my father had failed me. And I thought that was my greatest pro problem. And I remember when I was over in, at, in Tanzania, Africa, and I was going to give my testimony the next day through an interpreter, which I had never done. And that night I could not sleep and I was rolling. And I said, Lord, I really need to sleep because tomorrow I'm going to give my testimony. And the Lord said, I don't want you to give your testimony like you always give your testimony. I said, what? I mean, for years, I've, I've been hundreds of times. I've given my testimony the exact same way. Lord, I'm getting old. You changed the script. I might be in trouble. Um, you know, and I thought, what? He said, you still don't get it. And right there, the Lord, just like David said, the Lord taught me in the night season on my bed, the Lord pointed out to me and the Holy Spirit revealed, Kathy, you've gone your whole life, just like this man, thinking somebody else is your worst problem. There is not anything that anyone outside of you can do to you or hurt you that is your worst problem. He said, Kathy, you think your worst problem was you had an earthly father who didn't love you like you wanted to be loved. That's not your worst problem because the, your worst problem is in here. 
You have a heavenly father who longs to love you and have will love you perfectly, but it's your sin that has caused a break in relationship. Is this making sense, ladies? Okay, so that was a big paradigm. I'm my own worst enemy, not my father. And so that is what I thought, isn't this wonderful that this story is in here? Because Jesus didn't come and say, he even says to the man, who, why are you asking me to settle this dispute? Who made me an arbitrator over you? The problem is your covetousness. Because if that were true, that in order for me to be happy, I've got to get Jesus to fix everybody around me and fix my circumstances. He's not here anymore. He's in heaven. And so the glorious thing is, is that Jesus, if I'm yielded and I'm wanting to have a Christ-like response, he can heal that covetousness and I can be free regardless if my brother ever changes or not. Now that is a glorious, amazing savior. It is, it, I have to have some affirmation. Is this making sense? If it's not, I'll go over it again. Okay, so that is a, what I want us to have that paradigm shift. Now that does not mean that God is not sensitive to the hurts that we go through. And so we're going to look, but I have found in life, ladies, I'm gonna say this. God is not really that concerned about what happens to you and I. Look at that man. God really wasn't that concerned that that man was getting cheated. What was God concerned about? His response to what was happening to him. Because peace starts in here between you and God, regardless of your circumstances. And that's why the, the disciples learned them. That's why they could sing in prison. They could rejoice at whatever was happening to them. Okay. Okay. We're finally to Matthew 18. All right. Now turn to, we're going to spend some time on this. Normally when I do one of these workshops, I have to rush through, but I don't. And um, we've got plenty of time. So we're going to look at Matthew 18, starting at 15. Excuse me, that's not right. We're going to start at 21. I think this is the definitive passage in the scripture on forgiveness. So we want this as our foundation. Star it in your Bibles, ladies, so you will read it often. Um, and I have to revisit this very often because we all get hurt. Well, I just like with a show of hands, y'all won't be on the video, so you can do it. Who in here has ever been deeply hurt? Right? Mm -hmm. Who in here has ever deeply hurt someone? Okay then this lesson is for us, all righty? Okay, now I wanna point out, because we're not gonna have time to go there, but also I hope you read the whole chapter. I wanted everybody to read 18 three times because in seven, Jesus says a very interesting thing to me. I, I would I'll ask everybody to go back and study this verse. Jesus says, he'd been talking about wounding little children hurting little children. Remember he pulled a child into their midst and he was using that as an, a child as an illustration of humility. And unless you humble yourself like a little child, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven, much less be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then he kind of sidetracks and he talks about hurting or harming a child. And he said, it would be better for you if you put a millstone around your neck and drown yourself in the depths of the sea than that you offend one of these, my little ones. And then he makes this interesting statement. Woe unto the world because of offenses. But it is necessary that offenses come. Now, isn't that an interesting statement? It's necessary that they come. I hope we're going to learn why. I think it has to do with, you know, God even saying that, that he uses the wrath of man to praise him. That God can even use, he's sovereign, and he will even use the greatest hurts we experience for good. That's what Romans 28, 29 promises, that if you're in Christ, every bad thing that happens to you, God can redeem and use it for good. That's exactly what happened with the martyrdom of those five men 
that horrible thing, God took it and used it for tremendous good. It was an impetus for thousands to go onto the mission field. And then Elizabeth going in and winning that group of people to the Lord. Uh, all of that came from the fruitage of that horrible thing. Okay, now we'll turn and we'll read this passage. Um, in 21, then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. Now, um, I don't know if you know, but the Pharisees said that you had to forgive three times. And I'm going to point out something because I think it's interesting how we, even, even people that know the Lord, we are so prone to twist scripture. Why did the Pharisees say you only have to forgive three times? Does anybody know? I didn't know. I had to look it up. Because of passages in Amos. In the prophet Amos, in that book, God, God's speaking, and he says about, I think there's five or six different groups of people, and it says, because the country of Edom has sinned three times, that's it. And then he talks about another country. And then it, you can look at it in Amos. Amos is a short book. But like six or seven times, God says, I forgive this wicked country. They've sinned against Israel three times. That's it. So the Pharisees took that and twisted scripture. So they said, if somebody offends you, you forgive them three times. And then you don't have to after that. Okay. And that's, I think that, that Peter thought, if I say seven I'm going to get a real pat on the back from the Lord. If I say, if I forgive seven times, is that enough? And Jesus answered him and he said, no, I say unto you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Okay. And again, we're not supposed to take that literally. We don't have to count if somebody wounds us 490 times. Ooh, that's it. Okay. Now I, I can not forgive them. It's an, it's an infinite number. And so the, the point that Jesus is making is that we, we forgive always and we forgive without end, okay? When I first heard that, that was not good news to me. I was the poster child of bitterness and I didn't like God telling me I'm supposed to keep forgiving and forgiving. Is, is that happy news to your ears? No, but we're gonna get there, ladies. You know, I remember reading, this was another one of those paradigm shifts is you know how many times we studied the story of the prodigal son. And when I was reading that one time, and you know, we love the story when the son finally comes to his senses and he said, you know, the servants in my father's house have it better than I do. And so he prepares his, uh, to ask forgiveness and he's on his way back and who's waiting and watching? The father, okay? And when he sees him, he doesn't even get the speech out. And the father runs and embraces him and says, kill the fatted calf and whatever. And you know what hit me, ladies? Oh, my gosh. God loves to forgive. He's not like me. God has to arm wrestle me to get me to forgive somebody. He loves to forgive. And he wants us to be like him. And so here, that is what Jesus says. You, if you want to be like God, keep forgiving. and Be forgiving prepared. Hurts are going to come. Be prepared to forgive. Uh, have your heart in such a state. Okay. It's, and then Jesus says, I'm going to tell you a little story. And I love that Jesus was a storyteller. He's going to tell a parable. And so he says, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king who's going to take account of his servants. In the book of Matthew, Jesus talks about the kingdom all the time. And when you have a kingdom, that means you have a king, you have an area to rule, you have a people to rule, and you have rules to live by, right? And so that is the way it is in the kingdom of heaven. And he's going to tell us how God thinks, all right? You know, in the Lord's prayer, he said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, God's will is done. In earth down here, we messed it all up, all right? But thy will be done. We get to experience the kingdom of heaven here on earth if we're a believer. And we follow, we're, we're ambassadors. We're left down here, but we're trying to recruit people to another country, which is the kingdom of heaven. 
All right, we want to get them out of the world, get them saved, and get them into an, a citizenship in another country, a better country. All right, and so these are the rules of God's kingdom. There is a king, and he's going to take account of his servants. And you know, ladies, we're all going to have a reckoning day with God. All right, where everything we've done, every word, every thought, every deed, our motives are going to be assessed. And so this king is going to do that reckoning. And it says, and when he had begun to reckon, one was brought into him who owed him 10,000 talents. Uh, what does your version say? It says, okay, I did the math on that. Okay, we don't appreciate this because we don't take the time to look this up. I have, I'm not a good math person. I was an English major. But I, 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 I redid this, I don't know how many times. And you'll see some commentators that'll try to put it in today's money. Some say it's 10 million, some say it's 2 million. I didn't even bother with that because as Elkie pointed out, it, the, the, the talent, they did it by days, they reckoned by days wages. So I added up how much 10,000 talents would be. That's 60 million days wages. 60 million days wages. So then I thought, you know what? I'm going to figure out if, if each of us live to be 90, that's 32,850 days. So if we have 90 years, that at the let's say that gives us 33,000 days. This is 60 million days wages this guy owed this king. Now, again, the king is a picture of God and we are a picture of this servant because most of us, when we're hurt, we focus on what that person owes us. But he's pointing out that all of us, because of sin, this is how God views how indebted we are to him. 60 million days wages. All right. That is a lot he owed him. And then I'm sure this was blowing those disciples hair back. Don't you? Okay. And it says, cause here comes this reckoning day and he brings, and he says, but the man had nothing with which to pay. And so the King commanded him to be sold his wife and his children and all that he had to make payment towards the debt. Now there's that, and that was a common practice then if you were the servant of someone and you were indebted and you could not pay the debt, then you could be sold into slavery with your wife and children uh, in order to put something towards the debt. There's no way that would have made a dent in this debt, but that is what the king does. The servant, what does he do? He fell down and he worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay you all. What is wrong with that statement? It's, he doesn't need more time. What, what did you say? He needs more time. Yes, okay. And, and they're not going to happen, okay? It's appointed unto men when to die. And Moses said, if we have 80 years, we're doing good. Okay, what did he really need? He shouldn't have been pleading for more time because if you want more time, he's thinking he can pay off the debt, right? I just need more time and I'm somehow, I don't know what little side business he thought he was going to do that could cover that debt. What did he really need? Mercy. I need mercy. There's no way any of us can pay for our sin. It's too vast, too deep, too much. We're too indebted to God, but he doesn't see that. And most people don't. Um, I share many times, my husband uh, works in a private Christian school and when he was the admissions director, he had to determine at least one of the parents had to be a believer. And so he would interview parents. And, and so he said, it's, it's a wonderful job. I get paid to share the gospel because a lot of times parents came and they were not believers and he got to share the gospel. And he said, I can always tell when I have somebody who thinks they're a Christian, but they're not a Christian. And I said, well, how is that? And said, when I ask them, I always ask each couple the question, if you were to die tonight and stand before God and God would ask you, why should I let you into heaven? What are you going to say? 
And most Christians will say, because of the blood of Jesus, okay, he died in my place. I was a sinner and I accepted him as my savior. And now I have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. But a non-believer would say, well, I've tried to be a good person. Okay, thinking that you can earn or merit your way to God. It's a total lack of understanding of the holiness of God and how sinful we are. And so to have this placed upon us that God looks at our indebtedness as 60 million days wages, there's no way we should be pleading. And that's why we do plead for mercy and forgiveness from God. We cannot earn it. We cannot pay it back. We cannot be good enough on our own. Because how good do you have to be? To get into heaven, you have to have the righteousness of God. Only holiness can stand in his presence. I don't have any. Then how am I going to get there? He's got to give it to me. And that's what he does. Um, we are Jesus, it says in Corinthians, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If God doesn't impart his righteousness, then we don't have any. Is that clear, ladies? Okay, this, this guy is in a very bad place. All right, but he pleads and asks for, even with his lack of understanding, it says the king was moved with compassion because God is love. And he loves to forgive. And he loosed him from the debt and he forgave him the debt. Now, I'm going to point out there's several words um, in the Greek that are used for forgive. And I don't know how to pronounce this Greek word. It's A P H I E M I. That is the word here for forgive. And we're, I'll try to point out when different words are used, but this one means when you forgive someone, you are loosing them from the debt. All right. And that's what God did. And then in the Greek, it says in, in my version, I use the King James. It says, but the same servant went out. And in the Greek, it means immediately he got up off his knees and went out and found a fellow servant who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and he took him by the throat and said, pay me what you owe me. All right. And a hundred denarii is three months wages, okay, in this economy. And the fellow servant fell down at his feet and pled with him, have patience with me and I will pay you all. The exact same phrasing that the man had just used with the king. Don't you think that should have resonated with him? When he's choking the guy saying, pay me everything. And he says, just give me more time and I'll pay you back everything. And it says, and he would not. It doesn't say that he could not. It says he would not. And he cast the man into prison. It packs him in the Greek. It means he took him to the prison and cast him in and said, until you should pay me the debt. Now those fellow servants of the king saw what was done. They were very sorry. They were very grieved. And they came and told unto the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, Oh, you wicked servant, I forgave you all your debt because you asked me, shouldn't you? Now there's an emphasis on shouldn't you? This was what you ought to have done. Shouldn't you have also had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? And the Lord, the king, was very angry, and he delivered him to the tormentors. What does your version say? Jailers, some, torturers. Some versions say torturers. Some say inquisitors. Um, in mine says torturers, um, tormentors, excuse me. And it says, till you should pay all that was due the king. Then Jesus stops the parable. And then he says something to his disciples that I think is very interesting. So likewise, shall my heavenly father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother his trespasses. What do you think that meant? He's told a story. 
about a wicked servant. God calls him a wicked servant because God forgave him 60 million days wages, erased the whole debt. This guy turned around and somebody owed him three months wages. They asked forgiveness or for more time and he threw them in prison. And then Jesus says the king was very angry. He turned him over to the tormentors until he should pay what was owed. And then he stops the parable and he says to the disciples, my heavenly father will do the same thing to you if you don't forgive from your heart every one that offends you. Does that grip you? Okay, I ask people a lot of time, what do you think that means? What is God going to do to you? What's in the same way? What do you think, what do you think he's referring to? I've had some people say, oh, well, if we don't forgive, God won't forgive us right? You know, when, when, we, when you pray the Lord's Prayer, you ask God, forgive me in the very same way that I forgive others. Okay, that's a pretty scary prayer, unless you're really doing a lot of forgiving. Okay, but that's not what it says here. Okay, uh, just so you'll have a cross-reference, look at Matthew, right? I would write it down there. I've written it down there. Look at Matthew 6.14. Because I don't want to teach something that God is not teaching. I don't want to be like the Pharisees. Okay, look at 614. I think it's 614. Okay, it says in 614, for if you forgive men their trespasses, and the, the trespass means a, a sin against you, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So that's echoing what the Lord's prayer teaches, you know, Lord, forgive me in the same way that I forgive. That ought to motivate us right there to become better forgivers, right? It does me, okay? But that's not what he's saying here. What had he just done to the servant? in uh, verse 34 what yell out turned them over to the torturers or the tormentors that's what jesus is saying if you don't forgive my heavenly father is going to turn you over to the tormentors until you forgive all right until you pay the debt now, another thing I like to point out, and I know it's different in, if you read different commentators, what they say that means, but I believe that when, when God, who is pictured by the king, he forgives our debt, okay, it's forgiven. I don't think what, that's what it's talking about when it says pay what was due him. He put him into prison, turned him over to the torturers until he should pay the king what was due him. Now the debt had already been erased. So what do you think was due the king? Yeah. Repentance. Repentance. And what else? If you owe God 60 million days wages and the debt is erased, what is owed that person who erased the debt? Gratitude. Your life. I'm yours, okay? Praise, worship, okay? He was getting none of that because when we're focused on, if I just add more time, I could pay the debt. What are we minimizing? Our sin, we're minimizing our indebtedness to God. And I believe that's why a lot of us don't have a great love for God. Do you remember the story where Jesus went into Simon, the Pharisee's house and the immoral woman came in and started washing Jesus' feet with her tears and drying them with her hair. And Simon said, he thought in his heart, if Jesus knew what kind of woman that was, he would not let her touch him. And then Jesus said, he knew what was in Simon's heart. 
And he said, Simon, I want to tell you a little story. Whenever Jesus says, I want to tell you a little story, you're in trouble. <laughs> and he says, Simon, I'm a guest in your home and you're the host. You didn't wash my feet, which is customary. And he said, she has, she's washed my feet with her tears. You didn't give me the customary greeting, the kiss. She is kissing my feet and using her hair to dry her feet. And he said, Simon, I'm going to tell you a little parable. There was a king in a picture of God, and two people were indebted to this king. One had a huge debt, one had a small debt. And the king, who is compassionate, forgave them both. Which one of those two is going to love him more? And Simon said, I suppose it's the one who was forgiven the greater debt. And he said, you're right. This woman, because she's been forgiven a tremendous debt, loves much. But you don't think you have much debt, so you don't love me. And ladies, if we minimize our sin, we will not have a tremendous love for God. We, we need to own, whether it's in our attitudes, our actions, our motives, we are just like this man. We are indebted 60 million days wages to God and he's graciously wiped the slate clean. And so what is due him? Our allegiance, our worship, our love, our gratefulness. And if we really focus on what we've been forgiven by God, then we won't be like this servant. We, we, we are wicked when we don't turn around and forgive somebody who owes us three months wages. Is this making sense? Okay, so we need that paradigm shift. It helps us forgive if we can remember that I am a forgiven person. I am like that woman washing Jesus' feet. I've been forgiven a huge debt and therefore I should be gracious and forgiving just like my heavenly father. All right, that's one thing that we want to remember. And then the Lord says, because when we don't forgive, now I want to point out something here. This was another shock to me when I realized in scripture, forgiveness is not an option. We are nowhere in scripture asked if we want to forgive. We're commanded to forgive. He says, if you don't do this, I'm going to turn you over to the tormentors or the torturers. And now the torturers did not kill you. They made your life very miserable. They are going to torture this man until he comes to his right mind and then gives God or the king what is due him. All those things we mentioned, gratitude, yieldedness, worship. All right. And so what I have found is this is the most loving thing that God could do. God is love. And God's ways, his commands, this, we're commanded to do this. And we have to, again, adjust our thinking. The commands of Christ do not in any way diminish us. Okay, they give us the abundant life that he promised because God's ways always are paths of life. They're paths of freedom. They're paths of blessing, peace, and joy. It's the enemy who says, oh no, if you forgive, all kind of lies, okay? And he's the one because he promises passive life, but they're passive debt. The proverb that says there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It seemed right for me to get bitter. It seemed right for me to hold a grudge, but it was a path of death. And so the most loving thing God could do is to turn me and to turn you over to the torturers um, the, until we get to the place. And it's usually that torment and those tortures that finally get us to say, all right, Lord, help forgive. I'm so tired of the can't sleep at night, the ulcers, the grinding my teeth, broke, I, I, I can't take anymore. I'll finally do what we should have done to begin with. So it is really the most loving thing that God could do is to turn us over to the tortures. All right, a sobering passage, but a very freeing passage if we do it. 
we want to then delve into how in the world then do we forgive? Any questions so far on Matthew 18? All right, if everybody will pull out this chart called the wounded spirit. Now, for those at home, we're gonna have to do this for just a second, bear with me. Cynthia, you might wanna come see if I have it right, but we didn't think about how will people at home know this chart. So we're gonna hold this here for just a second. So if you're watching it at home, right place, you can see it and then even go back to it. You know, that's a good thing about your video player. You can pause it, your CD player, you can pause it and go back. And anyway, they will have at least a copy of those notes. Um, now, again, I hope you will take notes on this chart. Um, I've had people that say, you know, you gave me one of those and I went home and a year or two later, I got deeply hurt and I pulled it out and it made no sense to me. It will not make sense if you don't take notes. Um, but in order to do this, I need to share with you a little bit about my, my testimony, because really this whole Wounded Spirit Workshop came about because of my life. And as I shared with you, I was the poster child of bitterness. Um, I was um, not raised in a Christian home. And like I told you, I was raised right across the road. Uh, my dad was a cattle rancher. And we often joked with him, but also there was some venom in it. We said, you just, the only reason you had six kids was not so you could love them, but it was, you needed more ranch hands. And um, as there, so there was my mom and dad, and then I had an older sister and an older brother. I was number three, then I had a sister right under me and then two more younger brothers. And we are what, we were what counseling now calls a very dysfunctional family. My mom and dad did not have a good marriage. They did not have a happy marriage. Um, and I remember so, I don't ever remember resolving a conflict I remember a lot of verbal fighting and uh, hurt, hurtful words. And I remember crying myself to sleep many nights. And, um, and I, you know, I've had uh, friends from high school say, I were so surprised. We thought you were the perfect family. You know, you lived out in the country and we would come out there and ride horses and you had all those pets and animals and, and you just seemed one big happy family but they did not know what was going on inside. And so by the, by the seventh or eighth grade, if you had asked me, I would have told you that I hated my father. And I had already secretly decided and planned with my best friend that I was gonna graduate from high school and then I was out of there. I was not going to have that man rule over me. And um, the, the straw, again, my dad was not an angry man. He did not have a temper. Um, he never hit me. Um, he never really spoke unkindly to me. And what caused the wounding is my dad was emotionally and physically absent. He was just an absent father. He never gave me a birthday gift, never gave me a Christmas gift, did not come to my graduation, any of my concerts. I was uh, the lead in the school play. He did not come. And so I have learned since after that, I took a lot of counseling classes. I found I was very interested in counseling. And I believe a lot of people go into counseling because they have problems and they're trying to find the answer for themselves. And that was certainly me. And um, discovered that when, when children have a father who is emotionally distant or absent, then it, there's often wounding because you, you again, and I'm, I want you to write this right now. I'm going to say it so I don't forget, but I'll probably say it many times. Write it across the top of your chart of this wounded spirit. Um, and this goes right along with that man who asked Jesus to go fix his brother who was stealing his inheritance. It's, it is not what happens to us in life that is important. It is not what happens to us in life that is important. It's the meaning we attach to what happens to us that is important. I'm gonna repeat that one more time. It is not what happens to us in life that is important but it's the meaning we attach to what happens to us that is important. 
So I've had women come up to me and say, well, my dad never gave me a birthday gift or Christmas gift and I didn't get bitter. And I said, that's wonderful. The reason you didn't is because you didn't attach a negative meaning to that idea. I attach the meaning, I'm not worth remembering. I'm not important to my dad. I'm not worth loving. And so that festered. And then every time there was another transgression, I just added it to my little file of all the hurts for my dad. And I think finally the straw that broke the camel's back was I was probably in the seventh grade and I just so wanted my dad's love and approval and affirmation. And so I just went to him. I needed it so badly. And I said, daddy, do you love me? And he got this look, hard look on his face. And he said, well, if you can find somebody that loves you better, go live with them. And it was just like a knife in my twisting and turning. And so that was it. And that's when I started planning with that friend that we were going to, I was going to graduate from high school and I was out of there. And um, gratefully, the Lord intervened because he had a much more wonderful plan. But my senior year, it was spring break of my senior year. So I was almost to the end of high school when I was going to get out of there. And my mom and dad had been invited by my dad's sister to go to a conference, a Christian conference. Now, again, we were not a family, um, a church going family, but I have to add that we did go to a church here in town and my, my grandfather was very good friends with the pastor and he would come out to my grandparents' home where all the aunts and uncles and the cousins would go every Sunday. It was just a ritual and have Sunday lunch and the pastor would come. And I remember again, as a non-believer listening to these theological discussions, I would call them debates because the pastor was not a believer. And the pastor, it's a mainline denomination. And the pastor, he, he didn't believe in the virgin birth. He didn't believe in the inerrancy of scripture. He didn't believe in hell. He, I don't know why he became a pastor, <laughs> but they would, they would, there was a lot of discussion and arguing going on from this pastor. And, um, and so my aunt, uh, through another source and my dad, after we came to the Lord, my dad said about this church, we got saved through no fault of that church, which is a terrible thing to say, but ladies, you do need to be careful. You can be, I, I love what, um, Corey Ten Boom's father said, um, when there were Christian pastors who were not trying to help and save the Jews. And uh, he said, you know, just because a mouse is in the cookie jar doesn't make him a cookie. And so you have to be discerning if your pastor and your church is teaching true doctrine or are they in error? Because this, this um, pastor was teaching that a social gospel that we can, we can make ourselves better and better. Um, so anyway, my aunt went to this conference. She had lost her husband and somebody said, you know, I think this Christian conference would really, really bless your life at this time. So she went and got saved and she was so fervent and excited about the Lord. So she would come to those Saturday dinners and she would just talk about Jesus and, you know, blow that pastor right out of his chair. He thought she just had an emotional experience. Um, which it was, but it was spiritual too. So anyway, she kept trying to share Christ with all of us, all the family. And she invited my mom and dad to go to this seminar. She so wanted them to know Jesus. And so my dad, again, it's hard for him to, you don't find many people that want to babysit the cows. And so it's hard for him to get away a whole week, but he decided finally she was pestering so much. And the thing that did it was she said, I'll pay your way. And he'd always thought of his sister as kind of tight and the fact it wasn't inexpensive. And so they said, okay, we'll go. We'll just go one or two days. We're not going to go to the whole thing. We'll just go one or two days. And um, that will satisfy her. Well, they went and they were hooked. And so they went. It went every night, Monday through Thursday, all day Friday and all day Saturday. And they went. Well, the six kids, we were going what is going on? They're going to church every night. We, we didn't like going to church before. And so 
if we did go to church, it was at this church where this this man I'm telling you about was the pastor because he and my grandfather were such good friends and he had gotten my grandfather to donate the money for the, the chapel. And so the chapel is named after my family. So if we went, that's where we went because it was kind of the, the thing to do. And um, so anyway, on Wednesday night, I was so curious. I sat up waiting for my parents to get in. It was in Dallas and they were driving back and they got in after midnight and I waited up for them. So I was so curious about this. And so my mother, I was in the kitchen and they came in the back door and I, it scared me because my mother's face glowed. And I, I didn't even have any vocabulary to talk to her. And I said, mother, do you like going to church? Because we've never liked it before. And it was like, she looked right through me and she said, Kathy, I found what I've been looking for. Well, that scared me because I thought when you're a married middle-aged woman with six kids, I thought you knew what life was about. I never imagined that my mother was searching for something or had a void. And so I went back to all the siblings. I said something, you know, I think it's a cult. Something, <laughs> something's happening. So anyway, they went all the rest of the week. And then the most amazing thing happened. Again, we were not a family that talked. We fought, we never re, re, resolved one conflict that I can remember. And so my dad blew all the kids away. He said, okay, it's on Sunday, we're gonna have a talk and we want the three girls to go in one room and we want the three boys to go in another room. Well, we were so nervous and we, the six kids had a little powwow before that. And we said, it can only be one of two things. If, if it's forcing us to have a talk, either daddy's dying of cancer or mother's pregnant again. That's all we could think it could be. So we, we're waiting. So uh, the three girls were in my, my oldest sister's bedroom. We're sitting on the bed. I wish we had it videotaped because we were so, it was like we were going to face a firing squad and we were so nervous and the door opened and I have to describe my dad. So you can picture this, but he looked a lot like John Wayne in his older years. He was six, four big man my friends called him the bear that's why I have such big hands he was such a big man and um you never you didn't argue with him and so but I tell people about my dad my dad I never ever saw my dad cry and I certainly never ever heard my dad admit he was wrong well that door opened so in came this big John Wayne he looked a lot like John Wayne in his old year the big John Wayne looking man and he walked in and he walked over to the girls and to our amazement, he got down on his knees and he began to sob. And I remember thinking, that's it. He's dying of cancer. That's what he's about to tell us. And when he could compose himself, he said, Your he was just amazed. Your mother and I went and heard a man teach from the Bible. And he believes the Bible is the word of God. And now I believe it's the word of God. And God has convicted me. I have failed as a father. And he just laughed. And you know, in, in the book of James, it says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And ladies, the great, as, as my father humbled himself, the grace was flying in that room because my first thought was, I'm 18 years old. And my first thought was, there is a God. I've always wondered if there's a God. And now I know there is because he's humbled a proud man. I knew my father had faith, but for my father to own it, for the first time in my life, I had hope. And so he said, do you know, girls, that God loves you? And we went, <laughs> I mean, we were shocked. And he goes, he does. Would you like to learn more about God? <laughs> so anyway he asked our forgiveness and then he evidently went and did the same thing with my brothers and so we we watched as God changed my mother and father they were not the same people the, my, I found out later that my dad not only asked our forgiveness but he had asked my mother's forgiveness and he said I never 
I was such a scarred person that I kept everybody at arm's length. I will, and I put my mother before you. Would you forgive me? I did not know that God's order is God first, family second, ministry third. I didn't know that. You know, you don't put your job before your family or before God. We found out that he went to every neighbor. And I mean, driving our neighbors, you know, five miles away and asked their forgiveness. Um, he asked his siblings forgiveness. Um, we would come in and find them on their knees praying for us. And we thought, what has happened to our parents? There was a whole new love and sweetness in their marriage. Um, my dad said, we're going to find a church. We're going to leave that church that doesn't believe. And we're going to find a church that believes the Bible and lives by the Bible. This was all just shocking to us. And so the six kids, we had another powwow and we said, we're going to that conference and we're going to find out what in the world they did to our parents. Mm -hmm. And so we went and we, the six kids, I mean, we were front row and center. And I have to share with you, I was still bitter. I was so bitter at my dad and my mom. And so I, I was sitting there and I could hardly wait for the speaker to come out. And I really think in my mind, ladies, I, was ex I wanted to see the man that had whooped up on my big father, you know, who got him to bow the knee. And so I really think I thought like Arnold Schwarzenegger was going to walk out like the Terminator and I was going to see this man do it. And well, this little man walked out, he was the speaker and he looked like from my vantage point, he looked like a little, one of those little plastic grooms on a wedding cake. And I thought, surely not this man. <laughs> he can't be the one that, that whooped up on my father. But what I wasn't anticipating, it also says in the book of James that the word of God is like a mirror. And so if you hold up a mirror to somebody who has a dirty face, they're gonna do one of two things. They're either gonna wash their face or they're gonna try to break the mirror. And so we went and I sat there and for the first time in my life, as I heard this man, teach and preach from the word of God, I saw, oh my goodness, my face is dirty. I am a sinner. My whole life, I'd focused on my dad's failures and how he had sinned against me. But at that seminar, I was made to realize for the first time that when each of us stand before a righteous, holy God, and we're in the hot seat, it isn't going to be about, we don't get to point fingers as what they did. It's going to be all about what we have done. And I was going to have to answer. I never, I was so ignorant of the scripture. I did not even know that one of the 10 commandments was to honor your father and mother. I was, I was condemned on that alone. I had so disrespected them. Uh, there, there was no honoring there. Well, anyway, I was so convicted of sin. And there was a fear that if I died right then and I stood before God and he said, why should I let you into heaven? I knew I was going to hell. And so I cried out, salvation was presented through Jesus and I accepted Christ as my savior. I said, Lord, I'm a hell deserving sinner. I have sinned just as my father has sinned. And if, if I accept that you died on the cross, you died for my sins and I receive you as my personal savior. Well, I didn't know at that same, uh, that same day the sister right under me accepted Christ and a, the youngest brother accepted Christ. Mm -hmm. So we went home and with my mom and dad and three of us, the, our whole life just, just changed and turned around. And so what I would like to do now is to share with you this chart that made me aware that I was a sinner needing a savior. And I'm going to share it. This is not mine. This, I, this came from that, that conference. And it's called the Institute in Basic Youth Conflicts. And I have asked the owner, the author of it. He says I can use it. And so I'm going to use that with you. So if you'll take out that and please take notes. I'm going to uh, fill this out. But this is the chart that he shared with the audience that I, I thought he is, he is displaying my whole life. This is my whole life up on this video screen. And in fact, some of the stories he told I looked down the row at my sister because I was thinking, how, how could she have gotten up there and ratted on me? 
I mean, I, I thought he was telling my story. That that's how, how that's how much the shoe fit. Um, so anyway, I'm going to tell it just like he did. He he did, and and because what I want you to see um, is, and I titled this "The Wounded Spirit." Um, because I got that, would you write down Proverbs 18, 14? I was reading that proverb one day and it kind of jumped out at me. I thought it was an unusual thing. It says a man's spirit will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear it. And I was thinking about that verse and I thought, what does that mean? A man's spirit will sustain his infirmity. Now, I believe that um, this is, I, I know there's different views on this, but my view on scripture is, is that man is a three-part being. We obviously have a body, okay, that everybody can see and we relate to the physical world, but we also have a soul that's made up of our mind, will, and emotions, and then that innermost part of us is our spirit. And I, I, I believe that because of 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and you might write that down, uh, we're going to use that verse later, us being a three-part thing, because there Paul is praying for the people of Thessalonica, and he says, I'm praying that God will present you your whole body, soul, and spirit blameless at the day of his coming. And so that's where I thought, well, there's a reference to three parts of our being. I, I, that, that works for me. So anyway, it's saying that the innermost part of a man, his spirit, will sustain tremendous infirmity. Have you ever known anybody or heard of anybody that had a tremendous infirmity and yet they seem to live quite well with it? Okay, everybody can think of one. I mean, how, we all know Joni Erickson Tata. Is it, isn't she amazing? Okay, a, our spirit can sustain us through tremendous infirmity. Um, I was having to do some physical therapy one time and I was feeling quite sorry for myself. And then in came a man next to me and he was missing both legs and an arm. And they were taking off his prosthetic leg, one of them, and it was just ulcerated and oozing and bleeding. And I looked at that and, um, and then they had to take it back. And, and so, I, I mean, we're, we're you know, just staring at each other and, I, and I'm kind of bold. And I said, excuse me. I said, would you, could I ask you what happened to you? And he said, oh, I'd be happy to tell you. He said, I stopped to help a woman change her tire and somebody hit me and he lost both legs and his arm. And he said, but if we can get this prosthetic right, I'm going to be running in a marathon. And I thought this verse, a man's spirit can sustain tremendous infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear it. And so we're going to watch this chart really, not just, it's not just a chart of my life. It's a chart of thousands, what happens in thousands and thousands of us. Um, but really, you could put in little parentheses, it's really a chart of being turned over to the tormentors. This, you're going to watch how the Lord does that. And again, it's the most loving thing he can do, but how we're turned over to the tormentors when we don't forgive. Okay? And at that conference... Gosh, I am just going to get started and we're going to run out of time. I'm wondering if I should not start there. Well, let's see how far we can get. Are y'all good at remembering till next week if I get started? Okay. Um, at this conference, he began this chart and, he, and the, the speaker said, I came up with this chart because of, of a counseling situation that I was involved in. And there was a pastor friend of mine. He is a pastor. This he had a friend who was a pastor. And the pastor came to him and said, will you help me? I have a conflict, an ongoing conflict with my son. It, it, it's, it's been years. And we both love the Lord. We're both Christians. But there's a wall there. We've, we've sat down and we've tried to resolve it. But when we do, there have been times where we almost were going to come to fisticuffs. I thought he was going to hit me or I was going to hit him. And we just need a mediator. Will you come and help? mediate this situation and so he said I would be happy to help you he says but first could I talk to your son alone and he said yes I think he'll do that we but we both want to resolve this and get to the the heart of the matter so this pastor met with us the young son 
And so he asked this question, and this is a good question to ask ladies, if you're ever in a counseling situation, whether it's your children or your grandkids or somebody else, when there's conflict, he asked the young man, Did, has your father ever done anything to deeply hurt you? And the young man began to cry. And so he said, well, I can see that there is something because me just asking that question, you teared up, would you share it with me? And the young man shook his head and he said, no, I'm not gonna tell you. And he said, well, why not? And he said, because you'll think it's small. And he said, I assure you, I won't think it's small. If me just asking you brings you to tears, I know it's something very, very painful in your heart and in your life. And so after some, some um, prodding, the, the young man said, okay, I'll tell you what it is. And he said, when I was about 14, now I want to stop there. And this is where I hope you'll flesh this out uh, on your notes. This young man was now in his mid twenties. And he's going to bring up something when he asked, has your father ever done anything to deeply hurt you? He's going to recount something that happened when he was 14. It is a lie we believe that time will heal wounds. Okay, no, they won't. It, you're going to be turned over to the tormentors. And we're going to see this tremendous decline that happens in a life, uh, the disintegration that happens because we hang on to bit bitterness and God has to turn us over to the tormentors uh, as motivation, all right? So he said, uh, when I was about 14, my dad is a pastor now. My dad was a pastor then, and he was very busy, always busy with the church, visiting others and whatever. And he said, I did not get a lot of time with my dad. And so I think my dad saw that I was sad. And so he said to me, son, we're gonna, let's set apart a day in the summer and you and I just spend the whole day together. And why don't we go fishing? Well, the son loved fishing and he, he's telling this pastor, I was so excited. I was going to get a whole day for my dad and we were going to go fishing. So he said, for the first part of the summer, I mowed yards. I did all these odd jobs and I saved money and I bought a new fishing pole and the, the tackle that goes with it. And I was so looking forward to that day. And that morning the, the, the day I was up at 6.30 and I packed our lunches and had all the equipment. And at about 7.30, the phone rang and I heard my dad and it was a, a mission, like a skid row mission in our town. And they were calling my dad because the director was ill that day and they were asking my dad to step in. And he said, I held my breath as I heard my dad say, I'd be happy to, I'll be right down. And he hung up the phone and he said, I was devastated. And, he, and, he, and as he's weeping to this second pastor, he said, I wasn't crying because I wasn't getting to go fishing. I was crying because I realized my dad was not even looking forward to the day. Okay, remember ladies, it's not what happens to us in life that's so terrible. It's the meaning we attach to it, all right? So what did that boy think? I'm not important. I'm not worth remembering. My dad doesn't really love me. He loves the ministry more than he loves me. So the first thing that happens, do you have it there? Number one, what is the teen's inner conflict? The wounding of the spirit. And remember Proverbs 18, 14 says, a wounded spirit, who can bear it? The minute we get wounded, ladies, that's when we should address it. That's why we have to be forgiveness prepared. The minute we feel that wounding, that knife in the gut, if only I'd known God's ways, but I didn't. And so just like this boy, I didn't know what to do. And I got wounded and I nursed the wound. All right. And so what did this dad do? That the, the he, He's telling the story. And he said, my dad went out that day. He went to the mission and he came home that night. And, and the speaker asked us, I want you to picture, they're all around the dinner table. And you picture the dinner table. There's the dad, there's the mom, there's another two brothers, and there's this boy, and they're around the table, and the dad is talking about what happened that day. And maybe even somebody came to Christ, and he's real excited. And then he asks us, but picture that young boy. Can you picture him? Okay, is he joining in the conversation? No, in fact, where is his head? looking down at his plate. 
and he's picking at his food. And the dad keeps saying things and the other kids and the mom are responding, but that boy is sullen and he's looking down the whole time. And men who sometimes aren't the sharpest when it comes to picking up on emotions, he finally says to the mother, what's wrong with him? And the mother says, don't you remember you had a fishing trip? And the dad went, oh. Now, right there, I want to point out, the dad could have done the biblical thing, which would have been what? Ask forgiveness. But ladies, our human nature is so quick. Our pride is so quick to jump in. And I bet you can hear what he said next, because it's the same thing my father said so many times. And he said, well, son, wasn't it more important that I be doing the Lord's work? What did he do? The dad justified himself. Okay, that seems so right. But did the son go, oh, dad, you're so right. Everything's fine. No, because that just dug the knife in deeper. And I tell parents, sometimes my, my husband still works at a private Christian school. And we do this a lot because you're going to see it's what happened in my life. But as a parent, it was so helpful to see what's happening in your children's life and your grandkids' life. This is a great tool to be able to address the heart of the issue. Because when the dad justified himself, that did not solve anything. It created more problems. Okay, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And we're gonna see that's exactly what happens. So this pastor justified himself and, um, and, and, and so the boy has the wounded spirit. On the right side, you have some insights. And I hope on your own, you'll look up those scripture passages. But in Hebrews 12, 15, it warns about the devastation of bitterness because it says, beware lest any of you fail to respond to the grace of God and a root of bitterness spring up in you by which many are defiled. And that's the terrible thing. That's why Satan loves bitterness so much. It's one of his best tools uh, against the saints is that bitterness never just takes out one person. It will destroy families. It will destroy churches. Um, we must address this. Okay, so there's that warning not to get bitter. Now, the neat thing is we, we can't look um, on the heart of a person God can, but we can't. But thankfully, he gives visible signs that a person is at this stage. So what is the visible outward response that you can tell if someone has a wounded spirit? And the sign is there's a communication breakdown. My husband jokes that when, when he's wounded my spirit, he said, it's not just, there's not just a wall. You know, there, there's not just a community. He said, it's like the Great Wall of China goes up. And have you ever, has your husband or anybody ever hurt you and then they sense your hurt and then they try to touch you? What do you do? Don't you touch me till the wall comes down. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's something inward we can't see, but it's so real and it's so visceral. It's like, don't you dare try to touch me and don't you give me flowers until we get to the heart of the matter. You must take care of the wounding of the spirit. Um, okay, so another thing I like to write in here is when especially a parent wounds the spirit of their child, all meaningful conversation is over. We have to parent, we have to grandparent being sensitive to the heart and the spirit of our child. When you've wounded somebody's spirit, all meaningful conversation is over until that wound has been addressed and dealt with. That's why that great wall of China goes up and I don't wanna talk with him about any little peripheral things, the yard or the what I, I want until that is dealt with, then that, that wall is still there. But the dad did not sense the wall or the communication breakdown. And so we're going to go to step number two. Or maybe we'll get through number two. 
Okay, so the next step down is the what's going on in the this young man inwardly is now there's an alienation of affection. And that's just his fancy way. What I what I put down there is you just don't feel the same towards somebody once they've wounded you. You feel differently. Okay. And how do you know that the young person, how, how this, if this dad had, had known the ways of God, he could have addressed this because what you're going to see outwardly that indicates that the young person or, or us or at this stage is the, what the visible response is going to be ungratefulness. And I remember when, when I was hearing this, the reason I was so convicted is because I was so bitter at my dad for all these things he didn't do. Um, and this, that, that saying, you know, when you said to me, if you can find somebody that loves you better, go live with them. Uh, all this litany of things I had against my dad. At one point when I was in high school, my dad bought me a car. Was I grateful? Because uh -uh. he owed me. In fact, it was like I had this scale. And I remember thinking he gave me a car and I had this awful sneer and this attitude of, you, you think I'm going to be grateful for a car? Do you think buying me, off, do you think that will pay and make up for all the bad you've done? Okay, that's why husbands shouldn't try to bring gifts if they haven't resolved. Isn't this exactly how we feel? And so I wasn't grateful to my dad. I thought it was like another mark against him that he's trying to buy me off with a car and he doesn't know that he's just stomped all over my spirit, okay? So ungratefulness. Now, the, set, the, the insight over there in 2 Timothy, uh, we're gonna get that into some of the later lessons, but that is what, what Dr. Mitchell used to call the list of the ugly brood. And there are about three or four of those in scripture that where Paul gives a list of the sins that the unsaved are prone to. And you've come across those in Romans 1. Okay, adulterers, fornicators, murderers, stealers, backbiters, haters of God, lovers of self, all those lists of the ugly brood. But one that's listed in there is ungratefulness to parents. Okay, God hates ungratefulness to parents. It, uh, ungratefulness is in two of the lists, okay? But because ungratefulness is very hard to live with. Have you ever lived with an ungrateful child or an ungrateful spouse? If you fix a meal after meal and do their laundry and you never get a thank you, okay, it's hard to live. And so God doesn't like ungratefulness either. And so what do the parents do? When they now there's this ungrateful attitude in their child, what do they do? And you can hear it. Uh, and the parents compare. Now, what I put there in the footnote, when I was your age, okay, now again, we're going to see the foolishness of man's response as opposed to the ways of God. Because when these parents now have, the son has gone from just having a wounded spirit to now he has an ungrateful attitude. And so the dad says, you keep demanding that I get you a car. You're not grateful that I drive you to school every day. When I was your age, I had to walk. Okay. They, the snow for 10 miles. <laughs> through the snow or whatever. Okay. Because they foolishly think if I can lower my child's expectations, that will take care of the problem. And if they will know how much better off they are than I was, then they'll be grateful. So see, they're just addressing a surface conflict. They're not getting down to the root. And that's not going to solve it because what is the root of this conflict? The wounded spirit from a broken promise. That is the root of it. And until this dad addresses the root cause all this other thing is just going to be vain and useless. Is this making sense? Okay, ladies, we have to stop. I'm so sorry to leave you hanging. Please bring this chart back next time. We will finish this chart. And let me close us out in prayer. Also bring next time the circle chart uh, with you, those two handouts and your Bible. 
And let me close this in prayer, but we'll look forward to seeing you next Thursday at the same time. And then don't forget, you can watch the YouTube uh, if you feel like you missed something. Let me close this in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we just praise you for your word. We praise you that your Holy Spirit is work in each and every one of us. Lord, we'd ask that you would, by your power, set us free from bitterness and unforgiveness. Lord, make us like Jesus. Uh, go with each woman, Lord, keep them safe, give them time to be in your word and to seek you. And again, we'll come back looking forward to what you're going to do in and through us. And we ask this again in the sweet name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.